Andrea, Monza is Brembo's home race and it's a circuit with some challenges for the brakes, none more so than Turn 1. Basically, Monza is uh, one of the most demanding uh, tracks for the brakes. Uh, uh, and the turn one is obviously the first, uh, the first corner after a long, very long straight. So it's uh, uh, very high power and very high energy to be dissipated uh, uh, during this braking event. Um, the brakes are in any way helped by the low downforce of the cars that we have in this kind of track. Because uh, in order to reach a very high speed, uh, uh, you know, the wings of the car are uh, so little. And in, in, in this case, uh, the, the torque that you put on the ground are a bit limited compared to other to our truck. Anyway, the amount of uh, speed that we have to uh, reduce and uh, the, the energy that we have to dissipate is one of the greatest uh, during the season. And turn one is one of the most challenging for the drivers. So the car arrives at turn one, 330 kilometers per hour. What's happening with the brakes and the discs at that point? Okay, uh, the turn one is quite tricky in this sense because uh, after this long straight and considering also that uh, the parabolica uh, last corner is quite quite long, the temperature of the brakes uh, go down a lot because the, the, the capacity to, to cool down of this kind of disc is very high. And so you have to manage the, the brake duct during free practice and so on in order to arrive at the right temperature at the first corner. Our materials start uh, uh, from 300 degrees, we say, to, to work uh, in the best way. And during this kind of braking, you could arrive uh, up to 1,000 uh, 1, degrees. Uh, it, it really depends on the, on the balance uh, that uh, you find on the car and also in terms of uh, cooling strategy to be okay also in the other section of the track where maybe uh, the cooling is not so high. Uh, but in general, Monza is quite demanding in terms of energy and force to be put on the, on the braking, but the long straight between one turn and the other allow the braking system to, to cool in the best way. So no, no big problem in terms of temperature but it's just a matter of having enough power to stop the car tell us about the stopping distances at turn one it really is tiny L less than two seconds obviously it, it really depends on, on on the on the tires and o o again on the on the downforce that you have on the car but it's uh reduce it obviously we are speaking about reducing amount of amount of time but in that in that uh at that kind of speed the the space is uh it seems quite long but in truth it's, it's very short if compared with a, with a standard road car so we are speaking about uh, uh 100 120 uh maximum space meter of, uh, of braking let's say and when we're talking about these peak temperatures we are talking very much about the front discs the rear brakes with the current hybrid systems are working very differently through a braking phase aren't they yeah correct uh, basically the the big amount of the of the braking is in charge of the front axle first because the um, the transition of the of the weight let's say uh, that go on the front of the car for for the dynamic of the car on the rear you have the regeneration and uh, but due to the fact that you are limited in the um, let's say in the power that you can recover the first part of the braking is done by the brakes then uh, they are in some way disconnected and uh, the last part of the braking is in charge of the, the curse, let's say, the, the MG, MGK. Quite different from the past uh, and uh, is managed by the BBW that we supply to the teams. Is a, in a nutshell, is a, uh, an electronic actuator that uh, uh, generates the pressure on the rear axle and is, uh, uh, let's say, managed by uh, an electronic unit uh, uh, and a CPU that you have inside the, inside, inside the car. So let's talk about the discs themselves, the carbon fiber discs. How many holes they have and how long do they take to make? Okay, so the, um, the carbon material, disc and pads in general, is quite long. Uh, it's a complicated process uh, and uh, it takes uh, months to be, let's say, to be produced. Uh, I would say that the, what we call the blanks, that is the raw material before the final machining that give to them, the, the, the final shape uh, takes uh, something like six months to be produced. Then we stock them in our uh, in our warehouse, obviously, and uh, waiting for the final machining according to the spec uh, that uh, the team requests to us. So different shape of pads and different uh, drilling uh, of the disc. The drilling is, uh, let's say, 
was became quite extreme in the last year and we reached uh, up to 1500 uh, holes in a single disc the diameter of this kind of holes is uh, 2.5 millimeter and uh, uh, it cost a lot of development uh, to us and a lot of effort, uh, not only on the material point of view and, their, and, and its resistance, but also from a technological point of view, because you have to find a machine and tools that are able to, uh, let's say, produce this kind of shape, uh, and this kind of teen, tiny holes uh, inside, inside the disc, without uh, obviously uh, making scrap during the production. And uh, so they are quite... Uh, quite nice to be seen and uh, it's almost uh, incredible that uh, this kind of material can run with this kind of uh, let's say number of holes inside that's some fascinating insight andrea thank you for your time yeah thank you to you so that's the brake supply side of the technology and this is the teams and the driver's side, the most important part, and probably one of the least seen parts of a Formula One car, are the pedals. We very rarely see the driver's feet operate in them, and we certainly never see the pedals out of the car, but I have a set here. Now, these are actually a set of Jensen Buttons pedals from uh, Honda a few years ago, and that team has now morphed into Mercedes. And just to show you that this aero technology doesn't move very quickly, is that if you looked at the current throttle pedal on the Mercedes, it looks very similar to the one that we have here, although they did change to a carbon fiber pedal a few years after these ones were manufactured. And very much they are the main manufacturing techniques for brakes to have the main pedal assembly made out of carbon fiber or machined from solid. It's very rare that they're made from fabricated steel or titanium, although that was uh, a fashion many years ago. So for those of you who uh, are spotted this quite quickly, you can only see two pedals. And this is because the clutch is completely controlled by paddles on the steering wheel. So the driver only has two pedals. He has a brake and a throttle pedal. And the left foot operates the brakes, the right foot operates the throttle, and they never swap over. In fact, the last driver to use his right foot braking was Ruben Barrichello's, and he grew out of that quite quickly uh, early on in his Formula One career. Everyone now has a foot per pedal. So when you have a look at what you have here, you see the most important part of the braking system is the pedal itself and equally with the throttle. And it's important to have the design of the pedal set up properly for two reasons. You have safety, but you also have the driver's interface with the pedals. Safety, as I say, is very important. You don't want a pedal failing while you're out on the track under any circumstances. But then you have the driver's side, and the driver's side is split up into two ways. First of all, comfort, and then the leverages which they actually apply through the pedals. So you can see with the comfort, the driver has a pair of heel rests down here. So the back of their heel sits in here, keeps their foot steady, even when you're going over bumps and curbs. And then the height of the pedal, and then these side faces are all customized for each driver. They'll also be positioned front to rear in the car slightly differently, and there's spaces and things that the team can do to get the pedals in exactly the right position for the driver. And then you come to the leverage effect. Now, different drivers like different feels from the brake pedal and the throttle pedal. So what you have is between the pivot and then the uh, operating pivot here for the brake master cylinders or the sensors for the throttle pedal. This will all be slightly different per driver. And indeed, again, if you look at the Mercedes brake pedal this year, you can see that this area is adjustable. So let's look at each of the pedals in a little bit more detail and see how they work. So we'll take the throttle pedal first. This is the much simpler pedal that you have of the two. And this operates uh, sensors, either a telescopic sensor up here or little uh, non-contact sensors down here. And you'll always have two sensors in case one of them fails and that way you can always finish a race even if you have a failed sensor. Now the way the driver gets the feel for the throttle pedal is with a little spring damper that sits here, which is called the throttle damper. Now this is the thing that failed for Nico Rosberg at Singapore a few years ago. And what it is like is a, a remote control uh, car or perhaps a, a small mountain bike style shock absorber with a coil spring that gives the resistance for the driver pushing the pedal. And every driver likes it differently, but most of them like to have quite a heavy spring. There's only about 10, 20 millimeters of movement with the pedal. And the driver wants to have to push quite hard against Against something and able to modulate it quite accurately and equally not have it jumping about as you go over bumps and curbs. So that's the throttle pedal. 
And then you come over now to the brake pedal. This is the one that does the heavy work. So what you have is a very strong pedal. Now when the driver's braking, as we saw in the previous videos, they're putting a lot of pressure into the pedal, 130 or more kilograms of force being pushed into the pedal. And that comes partly from the driver's leg muscles, but equally from the G-forces of the leg actually being pushed onto the pedal as well. So it's not 130 kilograms of pure muscle, it's 130 kilograms of muscle plus the weight of that muscle actually under 5G pushing against it. That then operates the master cylinder. And this has changed a little bit over recent years. In a road car, you just have a single master cylinder up underneath the bonnet. On a race car, typically, you have two master cylinders, one for the front brakes, one for the rear brakes. And then you have what's known as a bias bar assembly here, which moves side to side and changes the bias of the brakes front to rear. And you used to see the drivers adjusting uh, units inside the cockpit to make that adjustment. Now, because the rear brake bias is looked after by the brake by wire unit, the teams can have a much simpler setup. So they have what's known as a tandem master cylinder, which is again, as another telescopic master cylinder, but you have both the front and the rear with a fixed ratio in one unit. And that simplifies the whole setup inside the cockpit and of the brake itself. Then all the brake bias adjustment is done electronic through the steering wheel with the brake by wire unit controlling the rear brakes. So a huge amount of force goes through this and the drivers, when they're pushing the brake pedal, it doesn't really move. Whereas in a road car, you feel more braking from more movement. With a racing car, particularly with Formula One cars with such heavy braking loads, the pedal will barely move a few millimetres and it's the pressure on the driver's leg that modulates to get the different braking force. Again, you have to realise that Formula One brakes aren't power assisted, it's all coming from the driver's muscles. So quite a bit is hidden away deep down in the footwell of the Formula One car, but you can see that there's some interesting technology. So from feet all the way through to the tyres, I think we've explained quite clearly what's going on with the Formula One car brake disc system.